Hi, um, thank you very much, Ava. And on behalf of the programme, we should extend a huge thanks to the ODI team for working exceptionally hard on this piece of work. It's been a massive and very collective um, effort, and it's been very focused at the local and national levels, which the team are very grateful for. And I think that's where a lot of the really interesting learnings come out. So, um, you know, it's been a massive team effort and well done for all, all of it. Um, so I'll just explain a bit more about the programme, um, who we are, what we're doing, where we are, um, that kind of thing. But I wanted to start with what we're starting to achieve. Um, and I really don't want to overclaim this, but we are starting to see actual changes in people's lives, um, which is the reason I get up in the morning. So the people and the images you've been seeing of the communities that we work for, they are everything to us. Those are the people that we serve. And I know the team feel um, also very strongly about that communities are at the core of what we do. So when we start to get indicators of change like this, we will get very excited. So this was from a piece of work in Uganda, and uh, it relates a lot to a lot of Rosalind's work. Um, and what we've done is we've supported the government itself issuing seasonal forecasts. So if you imagine in Uganda, which is where I live and where my husband is, um, we don't have weather forecasts and seasonal forecasts and that type of information. So imagine for those of you who live here and are English, what, how we would cope if we didn't have weather information. I think the whole entire system would crumble and nobody would be able to talk about anything. We love the weather <laughs> and information about it. So, but if you're uh, you know, very dependent on agriculture, that's not just, you know, that's quite a serious problem. Um, so what we did was support the government, and I won't go into too much detail, but we looked at the interconnection and understanding, first at the community level, are they receiving inf the, the information? If they're not, how would they want it? All this kind of thing. And then we worked with local government to understand why are you not communicating this kind of information with communities? What are the barriers? What are the challenges? Then we went to the national level and asked them the same set of questions, like why isn't this working um, and the, the national government were very keen to tell us well we go we go to the region we get the down scale data and information and we send it to the district but the district was saying well yes they do send us an email but we don't our laptops broken or our internet connection hasn't been working for six months and also when we do open up that email we don't know what that means and we certainly don't know what we're supposed to do with it so very basic uh, flaws were in the infrastructure <coughs> for communities getting the information that they needed. So we've just tried to facilitate those connections becoming stronger and that the community voices and not just their experience but their wishes and their concerns and their demands um, are filtered through that the levels of power around them, if that makes sense. So it very much links into Duncan's work on effective states and active citizens. It's kind of very much using that principle that that's how change happens and that's very much kind of the global theory of change that we work underneath. So what we started to find, we've gone out and found, you know, is this actually working? Is anything changing now that communities are starting to get this information? So this is in 15 districts and it's in 15 different local languages which has been a really critical part and we've done lots of gender analysis with the government to understand how do women actually access this information. So really basic things like when we did the first one, we realised that actually the men <laughs> were listening to the radios because they have control over the assets in the household and they were taking them away from the home and they were listening to football. So we were like, oh great, you know, all these female farmers are going to know be knowing how to um, farm differently. And then we realised, oh no, they're not. So we had to go and be more creative about how we would communicate. And this again is very much the government doing this. We're sort of backstopping and supporting them leading this process. So we went off and uh, the government have now done this at scale and found very similar indications of change. The reports are due out quite soon. But we have the quote here, so the fact that Akelo Lucia feels like this and is feeling this positive is just means everything to us and we want to do that much more at scale. So her uh, quote there, for the first time, we've received the weather forecast in the local language which, which has not happened before. When I heard the program on the radio, I was excited and kept listening every day. I don't know how to write, so I instructed my son to write the important points. I can't then read the next bit. Um, it's helped me to plan, <laughs> sorry. It's helped me to plan, and so 
for the forecast, so far the forecast has been accurate, and we have about 70% accuracy at the moment. So that's just a, a clue that sh somebody is there becoming more food secure, having uh, produced food for the family and being able to sell at market. So the, the uh, quote higher up is from a district official who's saying the other positive issue for the farmers w was that this time, so in this season, the forecast included agricultural advisory messages. So that's where local adaptive capacity comes in. We make sure that the government itself issues advisory messages that boost their citizens' adaptive capacity, which Lindsay will talk more about. Uh, the harvest has been high and some food is being sold to raise income. So for us, great. You know, We just want to have that at scale. So that, that national system can function effectively in the longer term without us there and meet the needs of its citizens, whatever comes. That's the idea. Um, so this is who we are and where we are. Um, so we're operational in Uganda, Ethiopia, and Mozambique. Um, and you'll see our... Oh, I forgot to change the logo, sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, so <laughs> you see our lovely donors, uh, who some of whom are here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the money. Um, <laughs> are supporting us and I have to say uh, particularly I don't know if there's anybody here from DFID ah fantastic <laughs> I cannot tell you how fantastic PPA funding is that must continue it's absolutely <laughs> been <laughs> fundamental to our success had we been tied into our log frame we would have failed abysmally it, it was our uniform ditching of our log frame that made us able to achieve this stuff and that flexibility so we I think it's really important to celebrate good donor practice when it's there and that's definitely the PPA funding is fantastic. Um, and so you'll see Save the Children. The idea is that it's an egalitarian kind of alliance. So I'm employed by Oxfam, but I'm working for the alliance. And we try and um, negate any kind of self-interested NGO practice, which I'm sure none of us ever do, um, by making sure it's egalitarianly shared across the countries. So, And that really works, because in country then there's more ownership, it's felt more as an alliance piece of work, and that collaborative work is something we want to explore more, which I'll come on to later. Um, so the main, the seasonal forecast is one of many change processes that the teams in country are involved in. Uh, in Ethiopia, we're involved with the climate resilient green economy, which sometimes is controversial, but fundamentally is a really potentially exciting piece of macroeconomic policy. It talks about, it's Ethiopia basically saying, we're going to become middle income by this date, and in order to do that, we see green growth and being resilient to climate as absolutely central to that. Great. Um, so that's one, and we can talk at length about that over a glass of wine. Uh, and then we're starting to really embed different ways of working at the local level with warriors so that women in excluded groups, for example, pastoralist communities, are um, directly and meaningfully involved in the decisions that are being made about their lives at different levels. In Mozambique, um, again, it's very much about that connection between citizen and state, and we're looking at that at the local level, how the provincial level supports the districts, and how the national planning system can pr support <coughs> the provincial level supporting the local and district level. Um, and there's some really exciting stuff in there. And we're also doing a lot of work with IIED on um, monitoring and evaluation. So it's tracking adaptation, but measuring the actual development, the real change in people's lives. That's really, we're fighting the World Bank. It's really exciting. Um, <laughs> and then in Uganda, I've pretty much touched on it. And again, a lot on that local, the interconnection at all the different levels of the state. So how we do it is collaborative co-production. <laughs> so we're really passionate about this idea about co-producing solutions. Um, most of uh, my team are from the global south and from the, the context themselves, and that's very conscious. Um, and we very much want to not be external actors coming in and imposing solutions and ways of working. We really want to explore the realities. We do a lot of political economy analysis, um, a lot of uh, research work, so we have a, a proper empirical evidence base, uh, a lot of advocacy, so looking at how you can get community voices influencing decisions being made about their lives at multiple levels, and capacity building. So it's very much um, trying to understand what's actually going on, and then get a lot of input on what people actually want, 
And that includes the government stakeholders. As long as the political will is there, we will listen to what their needs are and respond to that rather than enforcing it away. Okay? So um, that's an example of the approach. So this is our lovely poster. Um, and Lindsay's going to tell you more about the local adaptive capacity framework. But this is just an example of then what we do with that. So it's quite a technical and um, very good <laughs> piece of work um, explaining how this kind of change happens. But our stakeholders won't read an 18-page report. They just won't. So we have to turn it into sort of more creative tools. So this is how we capacity build, how we turn the research into practice, and how we also use it. We also use it as an advocacy tool to try and explain this is the ty type of changes that we want to see and how can we do that with you. So the key success factors um, so far have been understanding how change happens and power and agency. It's absolutely fundamental. It's, n it's non-negotiable for um, change, basically. And um, I think we've learned a lot that this sector has to smarten up significantly in terms of how it um, delivers advocacy work particularly. Um, having a clear and professional approach to advocacy and campaigning as well as programming. There's big internal discussions at the moment in Oxfam about programming versus and or combining advocacy. And for us, it's a twin track approach. You cannot do one effectively without the other. They have to be combined. Um, Long-term funding, right? So the PPA funding that we've been able to have means that we've established incredibly fantastic relationships with the duty bearers. Um, as well as those we serve. So we regularly go back to the communities and get them to tell us what they want and get them to map the power, the powerful around them, and then what they want those people to do, and then we understand better what they need from us. Um, Co-producing an understanding of the situation and systems in which um, partnership with those in it, that doesn't make any sense, sorry. <laughs> but it's basically understanding the current, the existing context, but not just in a token way, actually understanding it and working in it and living in it and being part of it um, is fundamental. Uh, Co-producing solutions with those affected, um, st both states and citizens, and, and individuals within, within that, the powerful power holders within those systems and states. Uh, interconnection and collaboration at all levels and across all sectors. So it's looking at purposefully working at the community, local, national, um, sub-regional, regional and international levels and understanding there's power and decisions being made at all those levels and you have to be in all those spaces if you want long-term more sustainable change. And then the final one, this has been great for us, being based and also being led in the Global South has been fundamental to a lot of the work that we've been doing. So just a quick plug <laughs> is this is, we're developing kind of a, a better understanding of how this kind of change happens in terms of climate and resilience. And <coughs> our basic thinking that we're trying to shape out at the moment is the communities at the core of it, and then co-producing solutions with local and national and regional power holders, so that kind of national base changed, and then reshaping global efforts to support change at the core and at those different levels. So how can the global framework and powers be reshaped and adapt to the local reality, um, which is quite a big question. And then, um, so we have, our current funding has ended and we're just moving into a two-year extension, but we're now on a mission. We are trying to explore with lots of other people how we do this stuff long-term. The bigger objective being how do we really actually support communities adapting to this incredible change that's happening at speed. Um, we see it on a daily basis and the suffering is significant and we <coughs> want to have a more collaborative, more coherent approach from civil society that isn't <coughs> dependent on the donors to try and find solutions to this. Um, so if you're interested in that, definitely come and talk to me afterwards. Um, so we've got two years to explore that because we're using the PBA funds to do exactly this. And uh, we want a collaborative effort to support women, men, girls and boys uh, strategically, effectively and at scale. So that's where we are. <coughs>